There is nothing better than seeing a brilliant game that you've probably never seen before from two players you may not even have heard of before, Vladimir Schmidt, I hope my Polish is at least a little close there, and Adam Kuligowski. The game opens here with pawn to d4, and we quickly get into a Nimzo Indian defense. Now, in this position, Schmidt is going to choose to play g3 against the Nimzo Indian, and Kuligowski is going to respond aggressively, striking at the center of the board and putting pressure here on that knight on c3. Now, I've mentioned before, I really hate meeting this stuff from the Nimzo Indian defense. You can get a good structure and a good game if you respond well, but it is easy, as white does in this game, to mess up when facing all this pressure. Now here, queen d3 puts pressure on the knight, d5 defends it, we take here on c5, which might already be a little bit greedy, and queen a5 now comes putting more pressure here on that knight. Actually, castling, according to the engine, may have already been better here than queen a5, but we're going to get a mistake in this position. Now, correct was bishop to d2, trying to neutralize this pressure here on c3, and after knight takes d2, knight takes d2, we get a position similar to what happens in the game, but without an entombed bishop on c1, so this is a clear improvement. In the game, we immediately try knight to d2 when this bishop on c1 is entombed, as I just said, and black is going to now be putting a ton of pressure on white. We get knight takes c5, attacking the queen. The queen cannot fall back because knight c6, and the queen is exposed here, and black has a significant initiative. Because of that, the queen tries to stay more actively placed here on e3, but of course, the queen is exposed here. This is actually a good example of a game that illustrates how you have to be careful about bringing your queen out early because she can get chased around, and you're very worried here that black is going to uh, increase the initiative with further attacks on the queen. Now, black simply castles here, which makes a lot of sense. If you try here bishop g2, black keeps the initiative coming with knight c6, which threatens pawn to d4, and so you may have to choose to accept this pawn sacrifice on d5 sooner or later, which is what happens in the game. So, after castling from black, we do get c takes d5 here from white, and now pawn takes d5, and then knight takes d5, accepting this pawn sacrifice. Again, you're not eager to accept this pawn sacrifice. I can't think that Schmidt in this position was super happy about going and being this greedy, but if you don't take the pawn, then after knight c6, you're gonna be threatened with the pawn's advance, so taking it does make sense. Now, after knight takes d5 here in this position, knight c6 comes, and then of course, bishop g2 is really, really natural. You complete your kingside development, and it's time to castle on the next turn, and everything is okay, right? Well, actually, there's a really strong move for black, and I encourage you to pause your video and try to figure out what Kuligowski played in this position. Of course, what should draw your eye is the potential development of this bishop. But after, for example, bishop g4, which makes a lot of sense, white is able to successfully castle in this position. If you go after d2, one thing to keep in mind is a lot of times this knight here will be hanging in some of these variations. And if you go after rook fe8, white can cleverly here play knight c4, moving that knight that is in danger over here while attacking the queen. Actually, white has an initiative here um, and a big advantage because there's a lot of stuff hanging for black and white is still up that pawn and has successfully castled in this variation in the game. So we must be more aggressive than the simple bishop g4. That's where bishop h3, boom, comes in. This move is just a thunderbolt knocking white out. Now, after bishop h3, of course, you're immediately threatening to take this bishop over here, and there's no really good response for white. Best, though, was to go ahead and castle and try to weather the storm. If you castle here, then after bishop takes g2, king takes g2, the rooks are connected because of that bishop h3 move that we played. So rook fe8, the queen is trying to keep in touch here with the knight on d2, so queen g5, and then you get h6, you're trying to chase the queen away. Uh, 
what white should do here is go for knight f6 check when the game is complicated, but I definitely think that it's white who's got to be very, very careful here, and white should get a perpetual with best play. If you go back with queen f4, then knight e6 is simply enough to run the queen out of squares. You will win d2 here. If the queen falls back to e3, then this is hanging here. The knight e6 move also opened up an attack here on d5. Because this looked so dangerous in the game, Kuligowski says, or Schmidt says, well, I might as well go ahead and take this bishop here and at least have a piece for my suffering. After bishop takes h3, rook ae8 comes, hitting the queen on e3. We're getting in on the e-file at the cost of a piece. Now, some things that lose right away are queen f3 when knight d4 uh, is a tremendous attack, hitting the queen, hitting e2, uh, and just unloading on the position. And obviously, d2, d2 is in trouble too if the rook takes on e2, and if queen f4 in this position, then knight d3 check is a relatively simple royal fork here you can't take because the e-pawn is pinned, so black wins the game on the spot. So instead of all of this, the queen goes to g5, again keeping this defense here. Rook e5 now, excellent move, hitting the knight and the queen. As a result, we get knight to f6 check. The g-pawn is pinned, so the knight is able to jump in here. The king moves over to h8, and of course, you're hitting the queen, and you're still hitting it over here, so at this point, white needs to give back the piece. Queen h4, you win the knight here, and then queen takes check and king over. Now, in this position, white is no longer up a piece, but white does have two extra pawns, of course, that's not the main thing. The main thing, though, is that white is uncastled and still in a big bind here, and this pin, for example, is really, really strong. So white would love to bail out, and that's why white tries here the move bishop to f5. After bishop f5, the rook is no longer defending the g5 square, so queen g5 check could be a perpetual check. Now, the engine actually says that best here is queen back to d8, forcing the queens off the board and dealing with the perpetual check issue when after a queen trade, uh, black, despite being pawns down, is just dominating this board. Of course, this is not what happens in the game, even though this is really, really good. That's just not the game we're playing. We're keeping the queens on the board and trying to punish the king, you know, not just with pressure and maybe material loss, but with checkmate. We get knight to e6 here when the queen and rook coordinate to attack this bishop on f5, and the knight is, of course, helping to stop queen g5 check and any perpetuals. After knight to e6, the bishop falls back to d3. The rook gets in. Now every black piece is humming. I encourage you, if you want, just to pause the video to look at this position. I love seeing positions like this. Black's rooks, two knights, queen, and bishop are all firing on all cylinders, and there are immediate threats in the position. Mainly, rook takes d3 when the bishop just falls, and of course we can't castle because that simply leaves the knight hanging on d2 and black wins material. As a result, white in this position plays a move that I'm sure white did not want to play, king to d1, does unpin the e-pawn here, but you are committing to your king surviving in the middle of the board. That is very, very optimistic, but again, there were no great choices available to white. Now, there are a number of good moves here, but Kuligowski picks the strongest, most incisive, and most beautiful move. Pause your video and try to figure out what it is. Rook takes d3, our second boom move. This is so great. After rook takes d3, sacking the exchange, we get pawn takes d3, and this position is crushing for black. The king is dead in the water here, and the knights now have tremendous access. You're going to see through the end of the game that the loss of the e2 pawn really softens up this general diagonal and the squares on f3, and this king is not going to make it.
Now, in this position, there are multiple wins. Actually, strongest may just have been hopping the knight in here, which seals the king in. If the knight on d2 tries to move to safety and attack the black queen, then this move is simply enough to win. Hitting the rook, threatening rook f5 when the queen is no longer able to defend f3, which is a checkmating square when the black queen gets to f3, supported by the knight here on d4. Instead, though, uh, Kuligowski does find another also very good way. He plays bishop takes d2, eliminating the knight, and then after bishop takes d2, there is no defender of the light squares. The knight could theoretically have been a defender, but it's not really doing that much. So anyway, after its elimination here, the queen simply goes over to d5, hitting the rook here. Now, if you try to connect the rooks with a uh, king here to c2, then after knight to d4 check, of course, the king is pushed back. Uh, and then this is falling with check. If you step up, you simply have queen c5 and check mate. So after queen to d5 in this position, we do try rook to e1 here. Notice that if instead you had tried pawn f3, by the way, rook f5, and then f3 just falls anyway, as well as more material after that. So after rook to e1 in this position, there is again only one way to win the game, which I find kind of special because it seems like everything should win for black. But when you play really, really strong attacking play like black has here, you still have to be really precise. If you're not, and here you play a passive move like rook f5, then white will have time to coordinate a defense. Instead, though, the correct move is rook takes e1. This is winning because uh, tactically white's pieces are just not able to hold all the squares together. So after rook takes e1 here, if the king captures on e1, then queen h1 check is winning. If the king steps up here to e2, it's not best to go and capture the rook right away. That's good, but it will give white time to make some dark square counterplay. Instead, better is knight into d4 check, and then after king up, you can check here, which is great. The king only can go back, and then after knight in, there's nothing better than giving up the queen here. Otherwise, it's checkmate. After you give up the queen on d4, of course, uh, you're also losing the rook on a1, so everything is collapsing game over. So instead, after rook takes e1, the bishop takes, and then the queen captures on d3 with check here. Uh, if you go king c1, then knight c to d4 threatens both knight e2 and queen c2 checkmate. So this is actually mate in two after a spite check from white. So instead, after queen takes d3, we get bishop to d2 here, and the knight simply hops into d4. There are many threats here, including queen f1 and queen e2, and this is basically a forced checkmate. In the game, white played pawn to b3, and after queen to f1 check, there was nothing better than bishop e1, and then queen to e2. This is where Schmidt resigned. Of course, if he plays the only legal move that's left, king over, then we have queen to e2 and checkmate. What a game featuring both bishop h3 and rook takes d3. Incredible hammer blows and an amazing example of an attack on the uncastled king. If you like that game and you also want to see games uh, by lesser known players that you may not have seen before, then just click on the playlist that is sitting right here on top of the chessboard.